Uh, well, thank you everyone who's attending and watching this video. Uh, we uh, are having this, this webinar monthly at this same time. And, and I'm happy to report we've got, I think, nine or 10 months out, all filled up with one slot in the spring. So uh, if you think of somebody who, or you yourself would be enthused about doing this, you know, drop me a line. Uh, today, uh, we have the good fortune of Bill Blackwell agreeing to present to us uh, from MIT Lincoln Labs, where he's a leader of the Applied Space Science Group um, and has a rich history of developing uh, airborne and spaceborne uh, microwave remote sensing uh, technologies and also leadership roles in IEEE and including many editorial responsibilities. Uh, also his talk today is, is co-hosted both by the IEEE GRSS Boston uh, group as well as the IEEE AESS Boston group. So uh, their uh, co-enthusiasm and, and co-hosting has resulted, I think, in our, our highest number of registrants for the webinar we've had yet for this. So uh, we're, we're grateful for, for their support as well. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll hand it over to Bill. Please, as with our other webinars, save your questions to the end. I mean, feel free to put them in the chat in the meantime, but we'll, we'll watch Bill's talk, then we'll have questions at the end. Uh, and if you have questions at the end, just sort of raise your digital hand and I will call on you. And without further ado, Great. Thanks very much. Let me, let me first confirm that you guys can see my slides in full screen mode. Did that work okay? Yep. Looks great. Okay. Yep. Fantastic. Well, I'm delighted to be here to, to talk to you guys today. I, I wanted to highlight two projects that, that I'm involved with, and, and both of these, I think, are, are pushing forward uh, instrumentation and, and future technology, so it's a, it's a good fit to the the, the webinar here. Um, the, the first of these is Tropics, is a, is a constellation of three U CubeSats with, with scanning microwave radiometers to study tropical cyclones. And the idea there is to launch a constellation to improve our revisit rate over the storms so we can capture the dynamics uh, and ultimately improve forecasting. <clears throat> and the second project is something called Cruiser, which is a, a configurable reflector array that we deploy from a small satellite that does a couple of things for us. Number one, it, it uh, provides the opportunity to deploy a, a relatively large aperture from a small satellite. So think of almost two meters on the side so we can get better resolution and or use uh, lower frequencies. And also it allows us to electronically steer a beam anywhere in the field of regard. So I just wanted to highlight the, these two projects and, and take you through where we are with these. There, you, you'll see that there are different stages of development tropics where we're launching satellites now. and and Cruiser, we're starting to work on prototypes. Both of these are funded by NASA. So let me get into this. So there are really two overarching interests that I have in this. One is um, this enabling technology of smaller satellites launched into constellations, which allow us to have better performance and, and persistence for a visit rate. And, and in a lot of cases, uh, you know, re, uh, reduce the cost for, for measurement of the things we're trying to make. And the example that I'll show here is, is microwave sounding. And just to you know, level set you a little bit here on the history and, and provide some context, on the left of the slide is a, a satellite that, uh, that NOAA launched. That's, that's the, uh, the SNPP satellite. It's a really nice satellite. It's got a host of instrumentation um, that work very well, very reliable system. But it's a big satellite and, and costs a lot of money to build and test and deploy and operate and you know, money well spent. But the regret of that is, you know, we don't have very many of them orbiting. These are polar orbiting satellites. And so we have a small handful and that gives you, you know, four to six hour revisit. So a satellite will pass over something interesting, a, a storm. Then you got to wait you know, four to six hours before the next one orbits and gives you another observation. So another way you could think of, of doing that is to try to essentially scale that up, right? You you, uh, you pick off some fraction of what the big spacecraft is doing. And in our case, it's the microwave sounding. And over here, if you can see my, my mouse cursor, this thing with a red cover on it is something called the Advanced Technology Microwave Sounder. So what we've tried to do is essentially miniaturize that and host it on a very small CubeSat platform, take advantage of, of a lot of standardization and um, new technologies in the commercial space sector. Uh, to reduce the cost and launch a lot of that and scale them up. That's got a lot of advantages. So, so Tropics falls into that model. So this is the first 
new frontier, if you will. And, and the second new frontier that I'd like to talk about is this idea of uh, you know configurable sensors that can react to what they're viewing, um, dynamically configure themselves to optimize for the viewing conditions somewhat in real time. And just three very simple examples of that. So in the, in the spatial domain, you could probably imagine that, you know, you want to uh, allocate your um, resolving resources to the areas in the scene which are the most dynamic, which I'm trying to show in this picture. So you want your finest resolution observations you know, occurring in the part of the scene with the highest frequency content. Right? So that's what I'm showing here. That's not how we do it today, but we could in principle do it this way. And then there are analogs in the spectral domain where you you, uh, you know, shift your center frequencies or your band pass um, to areas where you need them based on what application you're you're uh, you're serving or what scene you're looking at, so forth. And then the third is the geometry of the observations could, in principle, be adjusted to optimize something, whether it's uh, vertical resolution or coverage or or whatever. So you know, just a few examples of things that that could be, in principle, you know, configured dynamically. Um, so we're, we're looking at instrumentation that would enable this and, and conops that would enable this and, and ways that you might test this in the laboratory to convince yourself that what you're doing is actually useful and provide some kind of benefit relative to the state of the art. So these are really the, the two things I wanted to focus on in this presentation. So let me start with a case study of, of, of studying tropical cyclones, and this is where the tropics mission comes in. So before I get into the details of the tropics mission, let me just review the phenomenology of what we're trying to observe. So tropical cyclones have, there are a number of fundamental thermodynamic variables that we're trying to observe from space to better understand how the storms form and intensify and, and, and therefore hopefully improve our ability to predict track and intensity. So one of them is the humidity or the water vapor profile around the storm, which is in, in, in many ways the engine that fuels the storm. So we want to measure the humidity profile in the environment of the storm. So you can think of a three-dimensional picture vertically and horizontally is one variable. Another variable is the temperature around the storm. This is a, a, the image on the right is a cross section through the eye of a hurricane. And something interesting happens. There's a warming. The red colors are warm relative to the blue colors. And that warming near eight kilometers is highly correlated to intensity. So if we can measure the temperature in the eye, we can say something about the intensity of the storm. And the temperature around the storm, the environment is also very telling in terms of the potential for intensification. So we've got humidity, temperature, and the third thing is precipitation, which we can measure usefully with a millimeter wave radiometer. I mean, ideally, you'd want um, lower frequencies to penetrate deeper in the storm. But with a millimeter wave radiometer, you can measure scattering in the ice uh, and get a sense of you know, the asymmetries in the storm. Uh, and, and the eye wall, uh, the rain bands, things like that. And you can also derive uh, instantaneous surface rain rate to some degree. So those are the variables that we're trying to pick off with tropics. And the, the thing that we're adding relative to the state of the art is with this constellation, we can make observations with revisits of 60 minutes in, in the median or better, which we don't have today. So it's this combination of the three dimensions of these key variables with, with a rapid update um, that we hope will push forward uh, the science of, of tropical cyclone study. So there are a number of ways that we can make measurements like that today. Uh, we have ground-based radars, but those aren't very helpful for storms that are out at sea. The, the number of radars that we're flying in space is, is limited. Uh, we hope that that will grow soon, but at the moment we don't have the spatial coverage that we really need in the radar domain. Uh, we can drop things out of aircraft, hurricane hunters and things like that are, are very helpful when we have them, but again, this, the, the spatial coverage and sampling is, is pretty sparse. Uh, the geostationary uh, satellites provide amazingly good imagery in the visible in the IR of the cloud tops, but we can't penetrate down below the cloud tops largely at those wavelengths. So passive microwave sounding is, is a nice compromise in terms of, of our ability to penetrate the cloud tops and, and be somewhat sensitive to what's going on inside the storm and the storm environment. We can measure that with useful horizontal and vertical resolution. Um, so it, it's, it allows us to say something about those key variables that we're trying to study uh, in three dimensions. So again, the tropics constellation is trying to provide those measurements uh, with, with, with higher revisits and, and better resolution. So one of the motivating factors for studying microwaves is uh, you know the utility that you get when you try to um, assimilate those measurements into a forecast. So here is one study. This is the ECMWF 
uh, published last year, um, kind of a ranking of the, the relative value of uh, a lot of the measurements that go into the forecast model for a 36 hour forecast of track on the left and intensity on the right. And you can see that the microwave uh, measurements are tremendously valuable. The, those, the size of that bar indicates the benefit that it brings to the forecast. So the microwave is the single most important for these forecasts for, for this particular case at 36 hours, better than atmospheric motion vectors and sent measurements, uh, GPS RO, infrared measurements. So there's certainly a lot of value in the microwave and um, uh, a lot of benefit in trying to scale up and have more of these at better resolution. So that's one example of the motivation for us. In terms of the, the sounding or the profiling, people are often curious how we're able to derive a vertical profile of temperature or moisture with these measurements. And we use the uh, absorption features uh, that, that uh, have this frequency dependence that we can exploit. So there's a single, and in many cases, there, there's a single absorption line. And this is one example I'm showing here of this uh, due to oxygen at 118.75, where there's very high absorption at the center of that line. And as I turn the dial and move away in frequency from 118.75, the, uh, the absorption decreases. So if I'm staring down at the earth from a sensor, and I'm looking near the absorption line, I'm sensitive to the very upper atmosphere. And as I move away from the line in frequency, I can see farther and farther down to the surface. So by picking a series of channels that are progressively away from the line, I can measure from the surface. And as I move towards the absorption line, more opacity, I, I sense higher in altitude. So this is what allows us to build up this vertical profile of temperature in this case, or if I'm sensing your water vapor line, I can do the same thing for the, you know, for the moisture profile. So we have been working, as have others, for a while now on pushing for the technologies that would be needed to miniaturize a microwave radiometer and host that on a CubeSat. I just wanted to give you a little, a little bit of a sense of, of how far that's come and the ground we have covered there. So we started this over a decade ago. Uh, we are talking to our collaborators down the road from us at UMass Amherst. They happen to have an ideal receiver technology that, that was very low power. Uh, low size, highly integrated, uh, operating near 118 gigahertz. So we started working with those guys to try to figure out how we could make uh, a very sensitive, stable receiver that we could calibrate for this. And we started working with the MIT Aero Astro folks, Kerry Cahoy and others, on how in the world you would possibly accommodate a rotating radiometer payload on the end of a very tiny CubeSat platform with relatively low resources. Um, so we, we started to tackle some of these problems and that led to the MicroMass 1 mission back in 2015, where we launched this and improved a lot of the core functionality of the bus and the payload. Uh, that was largely successful, but the payload wasn't very successful there. The, the bus conked out before we could turn the payload on. But that was back in the day where you, you know, we were flying a, a $2 microprocessor to run the thing and the you know, $100 avionics board. Um, so, very, you know, shoestring budget type things where you go as far as you could with some of these uh, very simple parts. And we gradually uh, kind of moved to more sophisticated buses and more sophisticated payloads through some NASA funding. Uh, ESTO funded us to do the Murata, which was a multi-band system where we learned even more how to build and test these systems. And everything culminated in, in January of 2018 with the MicroMass 2A, where we had a scanning payload on a CubeSat with multiple bands. And that's when we showed for the first time that, that this concept really does hang together. You could make a really good measurement from a tiny CubeSat platform. And it was given this capability, and here I'm showing you the MicroMass 2A data on the left near 94 gigahertz uh, compared with ATMS on the right. The, the time that the satellites flew over this region is separated by about six hours, so it's not, a, not perfectly coincident, but you can see that the, you know, the data quality is actually quite good from the system. And with this, uh, it was it, it rooted the foundation for building a constellation of these to really scale up the capability. So from, from 2A, uh, there have been others that have, that have come after us and, and done great things. You've heard about the Tempest-D uh, CubeSat that lasted for, I believe, three years or so and collected data uh, from 90 to, to 190 gigahertz to do water vapor in, in five channels. You're seeing now commercial entities launching CubeSats with, with the microwave sounder. This is one example OMS GEMS 1 launched. Uh, I'll talk here in a minute about the Tropics Pathfinder. This was the qualification unit. We built seven satellites. The first of them was our qual unit. 
And we decided to go ahead and launch that to try out the mission and, and see how well things work and see if there's anything that we needed to improve before the constellation that worked really well. And that was really the first CubeSat to give a pole to pole global image uh, in these temperature and water vapor sounding bands. And then the constellation is kind of the last piece of this where we launched a constellation to get the revisit rate. And those will go up uh, next year. Okay, so here's a, a thumbnail sketch of the, the NASA Tropics mission. And this is part of the NASA Earth Venture Program. Uh, I'm the PI of this, and we've got a host of really remarkably great partners on this that you can see the logos at the bottom from NASA, NOAA, MIT, of course, and, and many universities helping us do this. Um, so the idea here, again, is to fly this uh, microwave radiometer payload observing in 12 channels, spanning 90 to 205 gigahertz. So we get the temperature sounding band near 118.75 and the water vapor sounding band near 183. And the, the two channels on the end bracketing that give us imaging capabilities at 90 and 205 gigahertz. And the 205 channel is new. It's never flown before. And that channel turns out to be very sensitive uh, to precipitation size ice particles. Um, very cold scattering in the storm cell. I'll show you some examples of, of how that is enabling some very high resolution imagery of, of tropical storm systems. So I mentioned we built seven of these. Uh, Blue Canyon Technologies built the 2U bus. These are 3U CubeSats, so they're about the size of a loaf of bread, uh, five kilograms. So two thirds of that is the bus made by Blue Canyon and one third of that is the scanning payload that we built at, at Lincoln Lab. I mentioned that we launched the Pathfinder in June of last year, that, that continues to work very well. I'll show you some data from that. We had our first setback earlier this year. We, we have six flight units that we built. We, we launched two of them in June, but the orbit, the, the rocket did not reach orbit. It almost did, but it didn't quite put us into orbit. So the good news on that is we have four satellites left and we've designed the mission to be resilient to failures like this. So we can still meet all our baseline requirements and even meet that 60 minute median revisit with only four CubeSats. And part of that is the specific orbit that we need to make that happen. So we're, we're launching into a 30 degree inclined orbit to put our satellites over the tropical cyclone belt. So that's part of the, the uh, magic of how we get that very good revisit rate with relatively few number of satellites. So let me provide some details on that. So, and, and the, the animation that I hope you can see in the bottom middle of the screen shows the the orbits that we go into that 30 degree incline with, with the equator and our relatively wide swath is a 2000 kilometer wide swath that allows us to image over the tropical cyclone belt uh, with a 60 minute revisit. <clears throat> the satellite is shown on the upper left and it's a very capable satellite in a very tiny package. It's got a, a solar array that rotates to track the sun. Um, the bus is actually rolling to track the sun while the payload is spinning. There's a full duplex radio. Uh, two star trackers, um, very low power consumption. So the entire satellite draws 15 watts and the payload uh, draws uh, three watts of that 15 watts. So it's low power enough we can operate all the time at 100% duty cycle and provide this great data. Um, so the ground tracks are shown in the upper middle panel. Uh, we have a network of ground stations through the KSAT light facility that we use to downlink the data. I'll have more to say about that coming up about our latency. And then the data move around from Blue Canyon to, to MIT to Wisconsin to, to do the operational processing. And then the data finally comes out to the, the Just Disk archive where the uh, public can download it. So all the data will be available for public consumption. So a few more details on the channel characteristics. Here are the 12 channels, their frequencies, uh, bandwidths, and so forth. And I wanted to call out just a few things on the slide. I'll leave it up and let you look at it, see what you're interested in. But the, the second column from the right is the, the spatial resolution, the footprint geomet geometry and the, the, the nadir diameter. Um, and it's quite good for a satellite that's this tiny. So the temperature bands with the, the nadir resolution is 24 kilometers. Um, for reference, the, the nadir resolution of the ATMS temperature band is, is about 32 kilometers. So it's a little better than ATMS, although it's at a different, it's a higher frequency. Um, so we're more impacted by things like uh, clouds and so forth, but still very good spatial resolution. And the water vapor resolution is about 17 kilometers. So per, pretty much state-of-the-art numbers, even in the, the small satellite, we're flying a little lower than, than, the, uh, than the operational satellites is one, one way we get that. And the, the any delta Ts, the sensitivities are also very good. So it's a, it's a very uh, sensitive 
high quality observing system, even in a small package. So the way that we operate and calibrate is somewhat different than, than the, the traditional radiometers are doing. So we scan at 30 RPM, so every two seconds, we scan across the Earth, and we have a 360 degree field of view. So we're taking data all the way around, not just the Earth, but also uh, against the cold sky background. So we use the cold sky background as a cold calibration point. And then we turn on a noise diode. It's injected into the front end for a hot calibration point. We do that every scan. Um, so it's very important that we uh, have a, a stable noise diode that it has a, a known uh, output power and that doesn't change over time or with temperature and so forth. So I'll show you some results on that later they look very good and then some details on things like integration times and antenna beam widths and things like that for those of you who are interested <clears throat> so we fly nominally at 550 kilometer altitude um so the uh the resolutions that i quit earlier are from that altitude so a few details on how the payload comes together so we're motivated to use as much as we can of that one u 10 by 10 by 10 centimeter volume for our antenna size optimize the spatial resolution. So this thing in the center of all this is a, a parabolic reflector with a shroud around it. We want that to be as big as possible for a good spatial resolution. And that means we need to miniaturize and tuck the electronics in the corners and the edges of this cube. So you can see the G-band receiver, the WF band, this is 90 to 120 gigahertz, uh, the analog channelizer, uh, control data handling, and the pancake motor, a very thin motor to spin the payload and a slip ring to get the data back. Uh, to the bus. So all this fits in together in the cube. We balance this up to keep it nice and stable when it rotates and it all kind of snaps together very nicely in this modular format. So here's some pictures of the, the flight hardware. Um, the antenna is is a, is a engineering feat, I think. There are two feed horns that need to be combined with this uh, wire grid polarizer, to dichroic, to combine the beams and focus them on this parabolic reflector. So we do this in a very small package uh, with very high beam efficiency over 95%. And we do that while maintaining its integrity over you know, mechanic vibration as the thing is launching and thermal as it's coming in and out of sunlight. So there's all kinds of fancy fixtures in here and similar metals to deal with coefficient of thermal expansion to keep all this working over temperature and to withstand the launch. Uh, here are the receivers, uh, the motor, control data handling with a hole in the middle for the slip ring to pass the data. And we're very fortunate to have NASA Earth Science Technology Office fund uh, some of the foundational work on, on this back-end channelizer and the receiver development for Murata. So a lot of that rolled into this development that you see on this slide. Okay, and here's the final payload put together. This is the qualification unit showing the receivers and the antenna mounted together on the motor and the pedestal. All, all ready to go here with some temperature sensors um, affixed here and so forth. So a very compact package. Uh, and here are the flight units. So here is the, the, the qual unit, which we now call the Pathfinder. You can see the payload spinning there at the end at 30 RPM. The array is slowly moving. And when we fly, the, the bus is actually also rolling, which doesn't affect the payload. We, we know what the rate of the rotation. We can back that out from the science data. And then here's the, the six flight units that we developed for the constellation. So we decided to, to do something that you would normally not want to do with your qualification hardware because the, you know we subject this to a lot of testing. So on the vibration table, a lot of TVAC cycles and thermal cycles to test it and prove the design before you start to build you know, six flight units in our case. Um, but we went ahead and refurbished this because uh, we got a, um, you know, one of these rideshare opportunities. This is a, a SpaceX Falcon 9 transporter launch to a 530 kilometer. This is a sun synchronous launch. We don't really care about the launch of this. We just want to test out the system. Um, so we got a, a 2 a.m. Uh, LTAN crossing with this. And this was great. This allowed us to essentially check out the whole mission to do a dry run of the, of the radiometer, the spacecraft, the ground processing, the comm and everything. And we got a lot of useful data out of this, and we're still getting useful data. So it was a really nice thing to do uh, prior to launching the Constellation mission. Here's the first flight. We we uh, we launched with 90 other satellites. We finally found ours after three weeks and started talking to it. And right out of the gate, we got some very nice global data. This, this particular channel is near 90 gigahertz. 
uh, at nighttime. So really nice data out of the box. And we overflew uh, Hurricane Ida early in the mission. Here's some examples of imagery at 205 gigahertz as the storm was approaching uh, the Gulf Coast and making landfall with the rain coming out after landfall. So we've got a lot of really nice storm imagery from Pathfinder so far. Here, here's one example um, showing our 205 gigahertz channel on the right versus one of 22 ATMS channels. They have a lot of channels. I'm just showing that uh, their most transparent water vapor channel versus our most transparent water vapor channel. And you can see, again, the quality of the data of the Pathfinder. Um, a lot of these features, the, the spiraling rain bands coming off of this, the inner eye, are uh, very interesting. The deep blue color of the rain bands showing the shape and the asymmetry, which are, provide very valuable information in terms of what the storm is doing and, and what it might do next. So we're very happy with the quality of the, of the image data from Pathfinder. This is Super Typhoon Mindel in September of last year. This is a uh, Cat 5 storm. Here is an, a more detailed look at, at, the, at the benefit of the 205 gigahertz. So again, this is Pathfinder, our channel 11 at 190 and our channel 12 at 205, just showing you the additional detail that you can get with this new channel at 205 gigahertz. So we're, we're reacting very strongly to this, the ice scattering in the clouds, this deep blue cold, these cold temperatures. That's what's causing this, is this frequency to the fourth impact on scattering. So we can see a lot of that with this 205 gigahertz band which is revealing a lot of the, uh, the inner structure of the storm. Here's a slide put together by Galina Cherikova at, at, at NOAA, comparing the tropics uh, measurements at 91 and 204, relative to some other microwave sounders that you might be more familiar with, ATMS, SSMIS, uh, AMSR2, and GMI uh, at 89. And one of the nice features of the 205 channels is it, it's, it's certainly not as good as these conically scanning images with you know, very large antennas. Remember, our antenna is about eight centimeters. These are over a meter, right? So it's much, much bigger. But with a 205 gigahertz channel, what we're able to reveal a lot of the structure that you get with these very large conically scanning systems. And so that's very interesting. And the, and the data quality compares very favorably um, to these larger kind of legacy systems. Um, here are some more shots. So this is Cyclone Batsuri in, in February of this year, again, showing the detail um, in the inner rain bands and the eye walls and the, the moisture around the storm. So these are the kinds of markers that we're looking for to see if we can uh, draw conclusions of the relationships of these features to potentials for intensification. Here's an interesting case. Uh, this is Cyclone Mnati. And at 205 gigahertz, we were fortunate to capture something called an eye wall replacement cycle. So you can see there's an eye within an eye here that we were able to resolve fully with the 205 gigahertz channel. The 90 gigahertz channel gives complementary inform information on, on the moisture fields around the storm. But we can really resolve the features very well with the 205 gigahertz, especially in this case where there's something interesting happening. <clears throat> Here's some more recent imagery. Uh, Hurricane Frank. Uh, Hennenmore and K uh, about a month ago, again, revealing a lot of the nice features of the imagery, deep blue showing a lot of scattering for the rain. Uh, here's Hurricane Fiona um, a couple of weeks ago. Again, a lot of, of strong scattering from, from the ice and the rain. And then here's Hurricane Ian um, just a few days ago, as it is making its way towards Florida. And then right before landfall, here's a picture at 90 and 205. So very nice imagery of the, you know, the eye of the storm as it's making landfall here over, over Florida. Um, so this is a, remember, a sun synchronous orbit for Pathfinder. So we're, it's a polar orbit. So we're, we can do things other than look at hurricanes with, with this particular satellite. And it turns out we're very sensitive to snowfall. So here's a case of snow uh, last October. Um, as you can see, we're very sensitive at this 205 gigahertz channel, even more so than we are at uh, 190. And we passed over a very intense line of tornadic activity uh, back in December. We were able to resolve that quite well um, with our W-band channel near 90 gigahertz. So there's a lot of interesting science that we can do with these uh, CubeSat sounders. So I've shown you a lot of pretty pictures. Um, but I think the, the real utility in the data comes about with, you know, 
the uh, the accuracy and the precision and, and the overall quality of the radiometric information in the data. So we've been taking some careful looks at things like the geolocation and it found by, by looking at coastline crossings, they were able to geolocate this to within a small fraction of a, of a beam width, which is very good. And, and I think it's pretty impressive given all the things that are moving around the satellite, the array is turning and the payload is spinning and the bus is rolling. Even with all that going on, we're able to use our star trackers and, and provide knowledge of the beam with very high fidelity. So that's encouraging. On the radiometric quality, we've been comparing the data to all kinds of things that we trust, like GS5, ERA5, other sensors like ATMS and GMI. So here's one example of that. So I'm sure the, the three vertical panels are the different channels. So at the top is our 90 gigahertz band. In the middle is the temperature bands near 118 gigahertz. At the bottom is the G band water vapor channels. And I'm showing you O minus B, the, the observation versus the background calculated using these models. And I'm showing that as a function of the instrument temperature. So the, the satellite is going in and out of sunlight. It's warming up and cooling down. We've got to convince ourselves that we can calibrate this um, over the course of all that thermal variation. And what I'm showing you here uh, is that that's, that's going very well. So in the case of the 90 gigahertz, the departures, O minus B is largely governed by um, surface emissivity uh, imperfections, not, not the, the satellite uh, instrument calibration. So that looks very good. Um, the red bars here, by the way, are our requirements, so we're meeting our requirements. And the accuracies uh, for the sounding bands are about half a Kelvin. That's, that's a very good, very low scan bias. Um, so the calibration is good and robust over a wide range of conditions, so we're very happy about that. One of the things I mentioned earlier is, is the noise diode drift uh, is something that we're concerned with, because if, if the noise diode drifts, our whole calibration will drift. Um, so here is the uh, the noise diode at 116 gigahertz over the entire mission. You can see it's it's very flat and stable. So so this is very good news for this kind of a technique to use noise diodes for calibration. Uh, the water vapor bands. Um, so the that receiver was reworked I think four or five times before we flew that. So we we knew that that had some issues, but even that looks pretty good. There there is some small but correctable drifts in that G band receiver. And we expect that will be much better for the constellation where we fixed all the problems that we had with the Pathfinder. So we're very optimistic that the calibration is going to be really good for constellation. And we've shown this already very good with Pathfinder. Very low drift. So we've been assessing our geophysical products. So there are five key products for tropics. Temperature and moisture profiles shown on the left. Tropical cyclone intensity estimation derived using that warm core anomaly I showed you earlier in the middle and instantaneous surface rain rate on the right. So we've been generating these products routinely at Wisconsin, what we call our data processing center, and comparing these with a wide variety of ground truth. And these look all, all look very good. Um, and, and in many cases on par with what we're getting with ATMS. So we're very happy about that. Um, so uh, just a couple of words on the latency. So the, the operational community uh, let us know very early in the in the development and planning of the mission that latency was was critical for them to effectively use our data in any operational context. They need the data you know, as soon as they can get it. And this is a NASA research mission, so there's no real requirement on latency for us. So we, we tried to do what we could with, a, with help from NOAA um, to improve our latency. And, and NOAA funded us to do a trial with Pathfinder where we showed that simply by turning on more ground stations, we can get the latency down to 45 minutes. And with Constellation, we think we can get down to 30 minutes latency using this constellation of the satellites together with a big network of the k satellite ground stations. So hopefully this will prove the utility for these data uh, in an operational context. We can use the data for uh, near time forecasting and now casting. And as a postscript, so the, the commercial sector has taken notice of what we're doing with Tropics, and they're very interested in working with this company, Tomorrow I.O., to essentially build more of these that they can launch in their own commercial constellation. So they have announced um, a constellation uh, involving 18 more of these satellites based on Tropics technology uh, that they're going to launch in a, in a very big constellation that hopefully can be used uh, in an operational context to, to further improve. Uh, weather forecasting and, and severe storm characterization. 
Okay, so moving to the the other part of the talk here, so I'm coming to the end. Um, so what what's next? What what what's left to do after tropics? Well, there's a lot to do after tropics. The tropics is a millimeter wave radiometer, um, and there are a lot of the features in these storms um, that that are, that are best measured at frequencies below 90 gigahertz, down to 37 or, or 20 or, or 10. And uh, to do that, you need a, you know, a big antenna. Lambda over D dictates that you need a larger aperture for these lower frequencies. So there are a couple of, a couple of enabling technologies that allow us to get that while maintaining um, adherence to a small satellite platform. So there, there are two things we're pushing here. So one is this idea of deploying a thin, lightweight, planar aperture from a small set. So there are multiple segments that, that deploy and unfold and snap together into a very rigid surface that meets pretty fine tolerances on mechanical alignment and thermal, thermal deformation and those kinds of things at frequencies up to 90 gigahertz. So we, we've shown that we know how to do that for other programs. So we're bringing that to this cruiser program. So that's one is this realization of a big aperture from a small satellite. The other thing is the surface is, is uh, configurable. So we have many tens of thousands of RF integrated circuits embedded into this surface that allow us to change the phase profile over the surface. That, so when the beam reflects off that, we can actually electronically steer the beam by adjusting the phase over the reflectory surface. So this is very powerful. We have a big aperture with an electronically scanned beam um, that we can use uh, for fully configurable sensing, right? We can put the beam anywhere we want it um, and dwell as long as we want and do all kinds of things that we can't do today. So I want to talk a little bit about the technology that's enabling this. This is an uh, instrument incubator program for NASA ESTO that we're working on now. <clears throat> so as I mentioned, there's a whole host of applications below 90 gigahertz that are very important uh, that we currently rely on a network of very big um, spacecraft and instruments to fulfill. And just to give you a sense of some of the applications having to do with clouds and precipitation and, and winds, uh, a whole lot of things uh, on the left. On the right, I'm showing you the 50 to 58 gigahertz uh, temperature band, which we're missing with tropics. And we're, we need that um, for a number of reasons. It's more sensitive to the temperature. That's why ETMS is flying it. So to capture some of these lower frequencies and get better spatial resolution, we need uh, larger apertures. Now, another thing that we can do other than having just a, um, a better spatial is we can be more intelligent with how we uh, direct the beam and how we sense and exploit geometry to our favor. Um, so one thing that you can do is, is exploit multiple look angles. So here's a very simple example of essentially using tomography to, to, to cut through the atmosphere at different look angles as you fly by an area of interest. And what you can do is use that information to improve your vertical resolution. So what I'm plotting there, those two plots are averaging kernels on their side. Um, so the width of, of that kernel tells you something about the vertical resolution. Uh, so the blue curves are what we get today with a single look. And by adding more looks, uh, we can you know, sharpen that up um, to, to almost a factor of two in the boundary layer, which is very important, uh, and more than a factor of two in the upper atmosphere. So I think there's some simple things that we could do to improve uh, substantially the way we sense the atmosphere, simply by taking advantage of, of the platform as it's moving over the target. If we know in advance, which we do, which portions of the atmosphere are interesting and would benefit the most by using this kind of thing. So that's one example. Here's another example uh, in the spatial domain where we wanna focus our resolving power on the regions of the image that, that would benefit the most, the most dynamic parts of the scene. So with something like Cruiser, where you can dynamically allocate the width of the beam and where the beam is pointing and for how long, um, you, can, you can sense the portion of the, of the scene that would benefit the most from, from these higher resolution, higher fidelity measurements. So the whole point of this is building configurable instruments that would allow us to do these kinds of things and, and run some tests to see how well they work. Uh, so the, the cruiser uh, concept is this 1.8 meter by 1.8 meter deployable six panel system. For our IEP, we're building one of those six panels. Um, we're calling that the prototype cruiser or a PT cruiser. And one of these is, is 0.9 by 0.6 meters. It has about 20,000 of these RF integrated circuits. Um, so we're we're now we have our first uh, chip run out under fabrication from Global Foundries that will come back for test later this year. So we have a, a traditional feed that uh, illuminates that surface, and then we again we configure the surface to reflect the beam in the direction that we want to go observe. 
So here are the key components to that. So there's the reflective, reflective uh, surface there. We've got a tri-band radiometer that we uh, can use to uh, self-calibrate. So one of the challenges of this is, is calibrating the system, right? Because we want to build the uh, reflector array with very high beam efficiency. So most of the energy uh, is coming from the reflector array. We don't have any spillover. We can understand any, any, any imperfections coming outside the field of view. But we've got to calibrate that reflector array and do that in concert with the calibration of the receiver. So that's a bit of a challenge we're working through now, um, but we're confident that we can, we can get there. We've got models that show that that'll work. Here's the, the unit cell. So again, there are on the order of 20,000 of these very tiny unit cells embedded in this reflector ray panel. Um, so that these are actually antennas um, at three bands. So you can see there's this cross structure antenna uh, which gives us the 24 and the 31 gigahertz, and then these very small square patches that radiate at 58. So that's the radiating part of this. And then underneath that is the RFIC that changes the phase state under each of these elements um, in one of uh, 16 states. So it's this, this 45 nanometer RFSOI process that we can use now to do that for us with very low loss at 60 gigahertz. That's really the enabling technology to do this with a loss that's tolerable. So if you compare you know, the, the attributes of a cruiser type system versus what we have today, it's, it's a very favorable comparison in terms of our ability to scan electrically, uh, the resolution that we get, um, the mass is very lightweight due to this very thin panel that we can deploy from the small satellite and the power uh, consumption is very low because all we're doing is changing the phase state uh, in these, each of these RFICs, which we can do with almost no power, uh, given these step processes. <clears throat> so there's a big win in terms of directing the beam with the resolution and keeping things small and low swap. Okay, so with that, I'll, I'll wrap up here. So we're very excited to show uh, really nice data with, with the Tropics Pathfinder system. Uh, it's very stable, uh, well calibrated, very accurate, sensitive data. Look forward to launching the Constellation. Next year, so the NASA Launch Services Program is planning to launch these in the, the remaining four in advance of the Atlantic hurricane season next year. So they'll be up soon. Uh, tomorrow IO, we're, you know, we're working with those guys to, to launch their commercial uh, version of a constellation. And then we're excited about Cruiser for the kind of the next phase of this that will enable lower frequency operation, configurable operation with a selectric scan beam and open up a, a kind of a wide range of, of intelligent processing and coordinated you know, data-driven type observations that are, are the next frontier. So, so with that, I'm, I'm happy to take any questions if you have anything. Wonderful, thank you so much. We have a, a couple of questions in the chat. And in the meantime, if folks have other questions that I'd like to ask, they can uh, go under the reaction button on the bottom and raise their digital hand. And so uh, looking through the questions we had here, uh, the first one was uh, just a question of how many radar satellites order of magnitude do we have in orbit? Yeah, so if, I, if we say, you know, precipitation radar, you know, it's a, it's a small handful, right? So, we, we, you know, there was the trim satellite. Now we have GPM. Uh, and there, you know, there may be a few other satellites that you might characterize as, as precipitation radar. So RainCube what was a big breakthrough a few years ago that JPL launched that, demonstrating that you could do radar uh, from a CubeSat. And that's kind of the, the impetus for the Incas Earth Venture mission that's coming up. So they're not very many, but there are plans to put more up. Uh, looks like Elliot Eichen has his hand up. So if you want to unmute yourself and ask. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Bill, great talk. Thank you so much. Um, I had a bunch of questions that you actually, I think, answered uh, in the course of the talk. Um, one was around uh, the usefulness because of the antenna size going down to 23.8 gigahertz or 37 gigahertz. Um, and then the other had to do with sort of this adaptive optics idea um, for for beam scanning and things like that. But I want to maybe go back. Basically, how big how big is the ATMS mirror reflector uh, compared yeah. to what you can do with um, uh, realistically with a cube stat and still have it make sense of the small platform? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good question. Okay, so so ATMS the instrument itself is about 100 kilograms. 
know, it's about the size of a, you know, washing machine, if you will. And so it has two antenna apertures on it that, that rotate. So one of them is about 15 centimeters and the other one is maybe 30 centimeters. So it's pretty big. So the ATMS goes down to 23.8. So they need that larger aperture to get useful resolution. And it's about, you know, it's not great. It's maybe 70 kilometer at 23.8 resolution. So it's, it's, it's pretty big, you know, 30 centimeters or so on that order is a big aperture to try to put on a CubeSat. Um, you know, it's conceivable, but it's, it's pretty tricky to do. So I mean, our, our approach is to go with this deployable planar aperture. We, we think that we can, uh, not only not only is it feasible, but it opens up the opportunity to electrically scan the beam, which gives all kinds of advantages. And and so and this is this is going to be a dumb question, I know, because my my background is optics uh, RF, uh, but you know bigger apertures give you better resolution, but they also collect more light, um, which gives you higher sensitivity. Is that true here too? Well, so we, we, we get higher sensitivity um, by virtue of being able to uh, resolve features in the scene that, that, that have a lot of, you know, dynamic feature to them. So, you know, the, the noise of the pixel, if you will, um, is not going to be higher or, or lower, uh, but you'll, you'll right. have, the, you have better resolving power so that, you know, the signal to noise ratio after you've observed your scene, it will be higher because you have this better resolution. So you said so that so the amount of RF you collect is less if the aperture is smaller, but the the resolution, the difference that you can measure is is better. I think is what you're saying. That's right. That yep. Right? And and one final question. I don't want to take too much of your time. Have you guys looked in, in addition to steerable to unfolded mirrors? Uh, there's been a lot of work on a membrane kind of mirrors where you you're able to put something up and then sort of blow it up and create a, a mirror in space. Have you looked at any of that stuff? Yeah, so we have. Um, and I think that is, the, the benefit of that I think is the greatest where you uh, you have kind of a, a fixed orientation. So it's it's very difficult for us to, to put electronics on a surface that's been inflated, right? Because it's not planar, or it's, it's hard to keep it planar, right? So that, yeah. does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. Thank you. The the, the planar affords us the ability to, to do PCB things, which we couldn't really, it would be much harder to do if it were inflatable. It looks Thanks. like uh, we have some questions in the chat. Uh, we have a question here. Um, how do you deal with RFI? Oh yeah, that, that's a good question. Yeah, all right. So um, I think there are a number of approaches that we're we're being forced to to, to uh, pursue very energetically in, uh, these days. So one is I think we need to be uh, uh, you know a lot more flexible and sophisticated with how we measure the spectral content of the signal. So we can try, for example, to use a you know very fine spectral binning to try to identify and remove. Uh, you know, kind of CW RFI. Um, you know, so we can try to to devise the receivers uh, in such a way that we can detect RFI and try to remove it if we can. Um, so I think there are a lot more. Lot, you know, there there's some sophisticated algorithms that are coming online where people are doing that now. So we're we're trying to to um, do it in the spectral domain and the intensity domain and radiometric domain, right? So you try to do it all. Right. Uh... Going to another uh, person who has their hand raised, uh, Duncan Robertson. Go ahead, unmute yourself, ask your question. Uh, sure, yeah, Duncan Robertson from the University of St. Andrews. Uh, thanks very much, Bill. Really exciting talk and, and obviously proud that uh, there's a bit of St. Andrews uh, intellectual property gone into that with the, the feed horn yes. design. Colleagues right. are on the call. Um, my question's about side lobes on the antenna. And how important is it to have a low side lobe level for either good radiometric performance or the geolocation? And how do you expect to get good side lobe levels with your reflectory type of antenna? Yeah, right. So it, it's it's absolutely critical. So so good beam efficiency, high beam efficiency is critically important in a number of dimensions. Um, 
So calibration, right? We need to know where the energy is coming from so we can calibrate it. If it's if it's coming to us from cold sky or parts of the scene we, we don't care about, that's a problem. Um, number one, um, we so I, I showed you some really clean imagery of looks at you know the eyes of hurricanes, right? So that's an example where we're trying to resolve that, and there's all kinds of high contrast around us. So if we have a you know a poorly performing antenna, we'll be we we would be sensitive to all that high contrast seen outside of our field of interest, right? So it's it's right. critically important that we have um, very good beam efficiency, and that's what your feedhorn designs gave us for tropics. So those antennas work tremendously well. So now now let's talk about the planar array. So we we again need good beam efficiency there. Um, so the, a couple of ways we get that. One is we need a good feed that's illuminating that. And the other thing that we can do is we can actually uh, taper the, 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 um, the, the profile of the, uh, the reflector ray phased surface, right? So we can use that to our advantage um, to first order correct for some of the effects that would lead to a poor beam efficiency. So we're, uh, you know, simulations show that we can get to the 95% beam efficiency with a planar array, but that does require some some fairly heroic uh, processing and, um, you know, customization of that phase profile across the uh, the face of the surface. Yeah. So you need the multi-level phase shift and presumably the low loss substrate and um, device losses, the phase shifter losses. That's right. Yep. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. We have another question in the chat here, which is what kind of star tracker and gyros are used for the space vehicle? Are they made as one unit, which includes both? I think the gyros are MEMS gyros, right? Yeah, so this is Blue Canyon's, um, let's see, what do they call this? This is their their XB1 bus. They, they're, so they have two star trackers. Um, and uh, yeah, these are all MEMS gyros. So if, if you need any more details of that, I can send them to you offline. Great. Um, another question uh, is written, what is the range of sensings of these CubeSats? So I, I don't know whether that's a spectral range or range of view. Uh, uh, let's see. Okay, so in our case, the spectral range is 90 to 205. The um, the view angle range, so we look at between plus and minus 60 degrees from nadir. So it's a pretty wide scan up to 60 degrees. Um, let's see, what else is there? We're, we're on all the time. We have 100% duty cycle. If I didn't get, it, get what you're asking, just ask it again. Great. There's another which says, does the Tropics G-band receiver have a one over F noise challenges? If yes, what was the solution to improve the noise equivalent delta T performance? Yeah, yeah. So absolutely. Yeah. So we spent a lot of time trying to optimize the one over F noise in that receiver and, and the solution. Um, so that is is governed by several things. OK, so there, there are the LNA chips at the, at the front of the front at the receiver. So you need LNA chips. Uh, the amplifiers need to have be very stable and have very good one over performance. But that's not all. Um, so the the video detection amplifiers, this the circuit is very sensitive to that. The detector diodes, those have one over F characteristics. Um, even the voltage regulators uh, will contribute to one over F noise. So we we optimize. It was a very much a system optimization problem, where we. Uh, you know, picked th those four categories of components to minimize one over F uh, noise. And we devised a very sensitive test system um, that would allow us to characterize, you know, Allen variances and all kinds of things to, to allow us to assess uh, which designs were good and which ones were not. So it, it was very much the choosing of amplifiers, detectors, um, op amps for the video, and the voltage regulators. Wonderful. Uh, here comes another one. Um, it says, great talk for your reflector ray. What is the optimal edge taper for best performance? Yeah, well, that's okay. So that we're now we're getting back to the beam efficiency. So that 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 is not a simple question for me to answer here in front of you now. So that 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 depends on on some things. It depends on the frequency, it depends on the scan angle, it depends on um the uh, the characteristics of the phase shift. 
Um, so that that was a, a, a good question, and it, it's, it's a, a long and involved answer that I can't really give conveniently quickly. Maybe I can ask a simpler, high level one. Uh, so I, you know, we've heard I've heard many talks about people enthused about these small satellites. Sometimes in the context of making sort of a tight constellation where they work together and maybe get a more directed beam or allow you to do uh, greater separation, but close by. In this case, you're talking about getting better temporal sampling. When you think about just in general, these costs coming down, these prices coming down, the, the mass going down, do you think, how do you think the comparative leverage is between operating as a close-in constellation versus this sort of improved repeat sampling you talked about here today? Right, right, right. So I think one of the things that's going to happen is the prices come down and, you know, the barrier to, to launching is really low is that you'll see a lot of these things that people call ad hoc constellations, right? You just put them up wherever you possibly can and you take what you get. And if you have enough of them up there, the performance is actually pretty good. You're gonna get good, you'll get everything. You'll get good revisit. You'll have clusters of them around each other when you need them, you kind of get it all. So I think we're, we're we're not far away from reaching this kind of saturation point where we're gonna have a, you know, a cloud of these things in the sky and we'll have everything, the coverage, the revisit, you know, at a very low cost. Wonderful. Do we have time for maybe one, one or two more questions before the hour? I, I certainly do. Yeah, I've got, I've got time. Sure. Yeah. So let's see. Double check. One more hands. I, I guess another. I'll, I'll ask you. You, you talked about uh, one of your points was, was flexibility and the ability to either adapt where you're looking or, or change where you are within a spectrum. Often, it's the case that something that is really flexible. Uh, is not as optimized for any one application as yep. something that is really purpose built. Is yep. is your sense with this that that's a big trade off, or do you think you've you've hit a technology point where you, where, where again you sort of can have it all? No, that I think that's definitely a big trade off. I think so. So the the uh, the big payoff I think for this kind of dynamic configurability is where you really have something highly dynamic that you're trying to look at a, a severe storm. Or an atmospheric river or a big frontal passage, something that you know that a priori before you fly over, you really need to make good observations of this. And you, you and you know what a good observation is, right? So you can define that, send it up to your sensor, have it do that. And I think that's a relatively small fraction of the time. However, I think it's a relatively big payoff in terms of the kind of the forecast impact. Wonderful. All right. Well, we'll do two more quick ones. So we've got uh, another question from. Duncan, and then uh, we'll, we'll ask one more from the chat. Okay, thanks. Um, but Bill, uh, in terms of launching the remaining satellites, I mean, I've been following the press on this, and you've obviously had your difficulties with Astra as a launch vehicle. And um, are you exploring other options? Can you say anything more about what options you've got for um, different uh, launch rockets? Um, yes. Okay. Uh, let's see. So I, I will give you the, the long story short version of this. So NASA Launch Services Program has something that they call uh, the Vader Program. And I'm not sure I can give you what that stands for, but it's essentially the venture class equivalent of launch. So they have signed up, I think, 12 or 13 companies to one of these IDIQ uh, contracts where they can give them task orders to launch things. Okay. So that, that list of 12 to 13 includes Astra, um, Rocket Lab, Virgin. Firefly, on and on and on, right? So, mm -hmm. the, so the Tropics four remaining satellites is going to be handled by that existing contract vehicle that NASA LSB has. Okay, so you've got options. We, yeah, that's right. Great, thanks. Great. Well, I want to be respectful for people's time, and we're at the top of the hour. So, uh, if you have additional questions, you can email Bill. And I just want to say thank you again for making time to participate in our webinar. This has been totally inspiring, and I hope to see all you all next month. Thanks a lot. Bye, everybody. <laughs>